I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. This week on the Poetry of Predicament podcast, I hope you'll help me welcome Hilary Jacobson. She's the sister of Elliot Jacobson, who was an earlier interview just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, both this brother and sister combination bring uh, a very unusual inner skill sets to their view of our predicament-laden world. Uh, let's explore in depth the inner resources that Hillary Jacobson brings. Welcome everybody to another round of the Poetry of Predicament podcast. And uh, I am your ever-present host, Dean Walker, uh, calling in from Southern Oregon in the beautiful downtown Medford area. Uh, with my guest, who just happens to be calling in from the same town. That's really rare. <laughs> Maybe a first. And uh, I am so pleased to be hosting uh, Hillary Jacobson today. Um, might be a new name for you, um, but there might be something vaguely familiar as well. Um, if there's something vaguely familiar about Hillary's name that you're not quite sure what it might be. And if you're a, a frequent watcher of this podcast, you might notice the similarity with a, a guest just a couple of weeks ago now, I think, uh, a relative newcomer to the blogosphere and the doomosphere, uh, both um, Hillary's brother, Elliot. Elliot Jacobson, uh, quite a remarkable writer and video producer, uh, long after his substantial career as a uh, professor in mathematics and also an expert in, uh, I don't know if he would say it quite this way, but this is how I understand it, you know, how to beat the system in uh, casino gambling um amongst uh, many other things and uh, i will be of course putting the link to my uh, previous uh interview with with elliot uh in the show notes and i uh, i don't know that i've shared this with you hillary um elliot really made a point uh, uh, and he said it a number of times that how i was introducing my take my framing of this collapse aware community and the collapse aware conversation and so on involved elements <clears throat> that were far closer to your wheelhouse than his and i mean he was to the point where he was just refusing to do the original interview and saying you just have to talk with hillary and so <laughs> i promised him i would and i i still wanted to keep my uh, my word to folks that I would gonna, was going to be introducing, uh, excuse me, interviewing Elliot. It all went well. <laughs> we, we understand each other quite a bit better now, and I think that there's far more overlap than he knew. And in the meantime, in our brief connections in setting up this interview, I am enchanted uh, first by what Elliot was saying how your areas of interest, the things that you've focused on in your life and your, your body of work, and the, the things that, are, that resonate as, as truly important or central for you, uh, and how much overlap certain pieces of what you focus on overlaps with my body of work. It's really been uncanny. <clears throat> so we will get to the specifics of that. I'm going to I'm stop talking in just a few moments. Um, I really enjoy asking folks that I get to interview. I, I love asking y'all, how would you like to be known? And uh, could you give us a little bit of, of your history that brings you to this place with the areas of focus that you have? 
the things that are important to you and how you express them so that we can talk a bit about those things uh, in this interview. Um, so welcome. And I would invite you to just pick up the thread wherever you would like to give us a sense of who you are and what got you here. I would like to be forgotten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I would like the work that I do to be carried on. Mm. And for it to be forgotten that it ever came from me. Because I feel that my work ties into the field of information that humanity shares, but that's been suppressed. So my ultimate desire would be that the field remember and that my transitory role in that disappears. So um, I was thinking about our interview and thinking about, do I have a memory with Elliot that I could share? And it's a strange one that came to me, but I think it's apt. And that is um, being driven to school when we were children. And I was in kindergarten and he was in nursery school. And our mother was going to UCLA. So we were in school, a private school that would take us essentially and keep us later in the day so she could study. And all the way to school on the highway, I would look down and I would see trees and trees and trees and trees. And when I would talk to my little brother about it, also through the next couple of years, he saw cars and cars and cars, right? And um, that always stayed with me that there really is like this, this essential, like, where do you focus? Mm -hmm. Where do you you focus and it can be quite different even if you're traveling through the same terrain so I think that um, is an introduction to Elliot and my relationship to our differences and um, so I my father you know he was an immigrant to the United States in the um, late 20s and um, yeah, he and very few others were the only survivors of our family on that side. So my grandmother was always saying, you've got to get out of the United States. It's going to hell in a handbasket here. You've got to get back to Europe. And um, when I was studying music, that impulse um, came true. And I, when I was 19, I traveled to Switzerland and studied historic music and essentially put myself through school with teaching and, um, and yeah, so music was my first real love. And um, I was looking forward to just being a music teacher, writing poetry and uh, doing yoga and raising my family with my husband. And then I ran into the first problem that knocked me off the path and that was low milk supply. And this was in the 80s. And this was a time when no one was talking about women actually having lactation problems. So I was confronted with a situation that when I went to my healthcare providers, they essentially told me there's no evidence to support that women have lactation problems. And um, my first impulse coming from my background with diet, meditation, yoga, et cetera, was, well, which herbs and foods will improve my situation? And the answer I got was, they don't. There's no relationship between what you eat and how you produce milk. Like, forget that. That's primitive thinking. That's wishful, primitive, magical thinking. And so I put it aside and I suffered greatly when I couldn't breastfeed my first child. And uh, that's kind of a unique emotional devastation that women go through at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's very little understood at that time. It was totally not appreciated. It's not exactly postpartum depression. Your brain actually thinks you lost your child mm -hmm. because otherwise, why would you not be breastfeeding? So you stop breastfeeding 
and a, a grieving process sets in that is completely unrelated to the actual reality because you have your child. And we call this breastfeeding grief. So uh, with my second Excuse child- Excuse me, but was that a term that you found and, and were able to speak about with others back then? Or is that what it's called now? In the early 2000s, um, we formed the first online forum for women with low milk supply or breastfeeding problems, or problems that weren't being addressed with the usual factors. And I discovered that all of the women, after we worked through their initial breastfeeding problems, were expressing this experience of grief, devastation, feelings of failure, wanting to die. Um, and that's when we started calling it breastfeeding grief. So, and that term took on its, its, its life because it's appropriate. So that's what we call it now. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you say is that it, it sounds like this was one of possibly many roots of how you deployed your attention. The first thing I heard you say was uh, a, an offering of, you know, Elliot expressed his attention, deployed his attention in a particular way as a, as a young person, while you on the other side of the car looking out this the other window expressed your attention, deployed your attention in a very different way. Then flash forward to your adulthood, your motherhood, and your experience of grief. This is very different and obviously a more far more adult viewing of the world, with very different content. But you're, it seems like you're now expressing a different part of life, that you we're experiencing a very different way of seeing and experiencing than the so-called so experts of uh, childbirth and and uh, uh, lactation and, and so on. The experts evidently were looking at the other side of the car, so to speak. They were seeing a, a different, You're very nicely put, different content of the world. Right. So this is would would you. I, I don't want to get too far ahead of uh, our conversation, but would you say that this has been a theme for you throughout your chapters of your life? Have you found yourself seeing the world in a different way, deploying your attention in a different way, uh, focusing on different elements in view than other people? Is it, is it something that's happened from time to time? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us more? <laughs> oh. Well, well, my mother, um, from the time I was little, had already decided that I was going to be a free spirit and run away from home and join a band of artists. So she put it into my mind that you always have to look at the world differently. Mm. And creatively, and that your job being born as it were, is to kind of blow things up. And that came, you know, very subtly, but it was consistent. And that was a big problem with my father because he totally disagreed, obviously. I mean, that was the case. But um, I felt that impact very much. You know, she took us, she took us to the um, anti-war demonstrations and she took us to Watts and she worked with, um, she had, before she met my father, she was working in Chicago with the black community, teaching children. Mm. And, but I also think there's something else and I think that's just uh, a proclivity that you have or you don't have where you put your attention. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> mine was always, I always had a bit of a mystical streak. Mm -hmm. 
And I can remember walking down the street as a young child, looking at the white shimmering bark of the birch trees and going into a deep blissful trance state. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of accompanied me throughout my life, this, this um, ability to kind of transition into a, a, a state of bliss, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people have that, but they don't use it as a guide. Mm -hmm. When I had my first trauma when I was 16, and it had something to do with being passed back and forth between my parents and a very unhappy situation with a stepmother. Afterwards, I lost that ability to go into that state. And I felt deeply traumatized by that. Unability to reconnect. So I worked hard at it. And one of the mm -hmm. things that I did was, I think starting when I was, 16 was I decided I was never going to go to another movie I was never going to watch television again because I felt that I had dedicated or lost too much of my development to that mm -hmm. and um, so and that, then I started meditating doing yoga uh, giving my attention to music in a way that was self-healing mm -hmm. and um yeah. If you if you don't mind, I'd love to just pause here. Um, if if for no other reason, I'd, I'd I'd love to go back to what I suggested might happen in this interview for the folks, you know, the viewers. <clears throat> I was um, suggesting that that uh, we might be exploring a, a number of places where your body of work, and now I would say it more like how you de have deployed your attention, how you have focused your attention, what, the, what are the qualities of attention and what have you chosen to attend to in your life and how there might be um, a bit of overlap in your history in doing that and mine. Uh, that I was I, I see that. actually just really surprised by just some written things that you sent me with some images that you've had uh, drawn up for uh, your book and so on. And I'm hoping we'll get to there. And I just want to um, bring a, a, a little bit from the current iteration of, of how I deploy my attention, how I've created this work, why I've do, done it this way, <clears throat> and how it actually ends up relating to the earlier conversation with Elliot and, and so on. And that is neuroscientist and a, a psychiatrist and a, a research uh, doctor named Ian McGilchrist, who's come up with a, a body of work that is just huge and, and very difficult to summarize in just a few words. But essentially he's describing both on the individual level and on the global level, we have a hemispheric imbalance. You know, the old right brain, left brain conversation. His assertion is that these are different qualities that happen, right brain, left brain, as he's describing it, than what we might have heard in pop psychology and so on. And essentially, the wrong hemisphere is running the show around the world for us individually and collectively. And so, you know, it's very easy for me to hear when you're saying you, you deployed your attention in a different way, you noticed different things and your mother's message to you was, this is the way to do it, to be able to use your attention in a very different way, in a very deliberate, different way. And it sounds like you did it. <laughs> you took that suggestion and ran with it. And so I, I'm just wanting to bridge a, a little bit here and perhaps a little bit later about this imbalance from, from the uh, Ian McIlchris way of talking about it. You seem to be an exemplar of having a, an appropriate balance uh, of the right hemisphere Whereas the, the uh, cause, the greatest cause of this 
huge global predicament, this collapse, human caused collapse that's going on has come from the left hemisphere running the show. And if we want to know what are the features of that, all we have to do is look out at the world and particularly the USA. And it's vividly clear what happens when the left hemisphere runs the show. There is no relationship. There is no context. No context. There, there's no ability to generate or see or appreciate metaphor. Like there, like uh, he does a beautiful job of describing uh, how the left hemisphere doesn't understand metaphor to the point where it doesn't get the punchline of the joke. So it'll say, I don't get it. And then the right hemisphere tries to describe it. And if, I don't know if you've ever had somebody try to walk you through a joke to then get to the punchline, but it's it's really a horrific experience. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Yeah. So thank you for sitting through that. I just wanted to yeah. bring in that, that uh, it seems particularly vivid in how you're describing your own trajectory in, into adulthood and into where you are now. And it seems vividly overlapping with Ian McGilchrist's tendency to talk about that imbalance and that you indeed seem to be an exemplar of somebody who has really cultivated your right hemisphere, that mm -hmm. realm of relationship, that realm of context, that realm of metaphor. So thank you for sitting through that. I hope that makes sense to the folks who are regular watchers of this podcast. Previews of coming attractions, uh, we have a lot of um, fresh content coming up soon that will make this, this work of Ian McGokris more accessible, more understandable for, especially for folks who are new to it. So I stopped you. Thank you for your patience with that. I'm wondering if you could continue the thread wherever you might like as, as you've, uh, you, you've given us a sense of where you uh, went in your earlier adult years starting to form this eventual interest focus primary focus on lactation motherhood these issues including the grief that you were experiencing yeah well first I'm, of all i'd like to say yeah. that yeah. my desire was not to fulfill my mother's wish to explode the world wow. my desire was to have some peace and quiet and just mm -hmm. to do music mm -hmm. so i got my little family together and I did my yoga. I wrote my novel. I taught the flute. I practiced, I taught meditation in teaching the flute and sound projection. And, but um, I really didn't want to do this. And then it came to me. Right. And then you take it on. Mm -hmm. So, but what happened was that in my personal healing from my family with my hyper rational father and my hyper emotional mother, right? And my mother had some kind of occult tendencies. Um, she describes to me, not to Elliot, Elliot doesn't have this memory of meeting a soldier in a train. And well, she grew up in the depression and her grandmother read the cards to propagate an income for the family. And my mother would sit next to her during the card readings. And so she kind of absorbed it. And one day her grandmother was, couldn't do it. So she did it and she hated it because she hated the fact that the other person was hanging on to her every word and that she felt that she had a kind of an undeserved influence on that person's life. And she had the same thing with, uh, she read someone's hand a soldier's hand and I don't know why she learned this stuff but she did and she said it looks like you'll never have children and he broke down crying because he had lost his ability to have children and those experiences freaked her out and I saw my mother as someone who had this great intuitive quality but couldn't access it because it scared her right so she was very kind of disjointed in that way. And when I left the, the trauma of my early childhood 
and escaped to Europe, it was, I want peace and quiet, right? But then everything caught up with me. But in finding that peace and quiet, one of the things that I was very blessed to experience was getting connected to a, a, med, a high high level meditation teacher who was not known to the world and who I only met through very, you know, sort of strange circumstances. And suddenly I was invited to this very high level teacher. And I, I worked with him uh, seven summers and, um, and I, I heard you or some, I think you or one of, in one of your talks or somebody similar saying that the problem with the old forms of meditation is that they did not use the feelings. And I know, I know what that means, but that was different here. Here it was very much be with what is and ways to allow feelings to come up and to work with them and to allow them to transform. And um, so I had that background with this teacher. And later when I um, studied hypnotherapy, which again, I got into entirely by chance. Like I had a chance meeting that brought me to that teacher. What brought me to hypnotherapy was my daughter wanted to do a class and she dropped out at the last moment and she had already reserved her spot. So I stood in for her. And the teacher is this extremely spiritual woman. And so I got the tools in essence to like, there's, there's, there's a lot of overlap between that kind of meditation and the kind of hypnotherapy that I eventually learned to do. Mm -hmm. And when I learned the hypnotherapy, I immediately realized that, holy cow, a prayer has been answered because I had I don't pray very often, but I had actually gotten down on my knees one time, I think in around 2010, and I had prayed to learn a way to help women heal from breastfeeding grief. Mm -hmm. And at the end of this hypnotherapy session, I realized school, I realized that I it was only in the last days that I realized, oh my God, I've just received those tools. So what resulted from my initial course of study, I, I don't know if you if this is going to show backwards. No, it's it's straight up. It's it's straight up. Yeah. That's my initial book, Mother Food. And that's mm -hmm. about the 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 way that um, diet and her herbs um, and our past life are, in other words, our um, our dietary habits from long ago and our right. use of medications, our gut health, our food allergies, how that all plays a role in um, lactation, colic, infant allergy, and so on. And I put that all together. It was a work of 15 years to get that book done. And it was then published in 2004 initially and more widely in 2007. And it's it's still selling today and it's still highly recommended today when people say you must be proud of yourself. I say, well, yeah, I'm sure I'm proud of myself. But on the other hand, I think it's very sad that it's still kind of one of its kind in the sense that it looks holistically at kind of all the ways that diet influence of the mother child situation in early, early postpartum. Yeah. May it I'd like to just stop you again to to just double check or or reflect back to make sure okay. I'm I'm on track and and to ask a couple of clarifying questions. <clears throat> it seems like you introduced us to some of your lineage, your mother, uh, and a, a few examples of what I would call reluctant seers. Uh, I've mm -hmm. been involved with a number of lineages of energetic instruction or, or mentorship, uh, whether that's shamanic or uh, transformation-based uh, energetic studies and so on. And so one of the distinctions from a more recent teacher was something along the lines of a reluctant seer. And I think that that's, that seems to be a lot of the way that it, it's 
often the only way it gets to show up as a as a gift or as a an attribute that a person might have because our our usual culture has no way to acknowledge that it's not something that everybody you know gathers around and let's see hillary's gifts you know in terms of seeing or unusual ways of perceiving or presencing in the world so is it safe to say that that's something that was showing up in in those pieces you were describing with with your mother and the and the readings and so on yeah. and i'm curious are you are you also drawing a thread into your own perception would you also call yourself something of a reluctant seer you know having some amount of gifts that were starting to show up and in perhaps your time your strong desire for quiet might have kind of left those gifts in the background for a while while you enjoyed that quiet and i'm just making this up and so this is really for you to reflect and, and set me straight it seems like what i'm hearing is that you then found that meditation teacher and there was some sort of structure some sort of uh parameters set for your attention through this uh, remarkable yes. teacher and i cert that's certainly the case for myself as, as i have been a reluctant seer most of my life and right. and to then bump into a teacher or, or a mentor who can provide structure that is really more of an invitation than some sort of reigning in. It's actually a, a, a stronger, more focused invitation to expression. That's certainly the way it's shown up. That's We're in a podcast right now, which is a part of my expression that has come directly out of that mentorship. So, um, I've said a lot, I've shared a bit about how that has been so for me. I'm wondering if any part of that is so for you, and is that a fair way to reflect it back to you? Oh, that's a good question and a hard one to, I love the way you describe that, the reluctance mm. seer. Um, something that I felt with my mother is that she became very bitter. Mm. She became very, very bitter. And um, she had a very difficult childhood herself. Her family was illiterate. Her parents were illiterate. Mm -hmm. And um, and she was, her intuition was closely associated for her with psychosis. She had a psychotic episode when she was 16, again, when she was 18. And it, so she had endured a lot of isolation that led to that. Mm -hmm. And um, I swore to myself as a child that I was not going to become bitter. And whatever else happened in life, I was going mm -hmm. to strive for better integration and I was not going to become bitter. And there were times in my life when that was really hard. Yeah. When I had Lyme disease, that was really hard especially because I felt that it injured my ability to be a full mother for my children. And that made me feel very sad and very bitter. But um, that was my, my goal was not to become bitter. And, um, and so when I was 17, I studied astrology with a meditation teacher. But Astrology for me became immediately a set of symbols. It became like, oh, wow, there's this really ancient way of looking at personality types. And I could feel how it, it expanded me to think about that, think about it that way. And so I was already working with archetypes when I went to Switzerland through the astrology and also I had been a fundamentalist Christian very briefly as um, an adolescent. This actually had a profound effect on me. I, you know, I came from a completely atheist family. My father and mother were breaking up. They essentially hated each other. And that field of tension was in the family. And uh, a girlfriend from school took me she adopted me and her family adopted me and they were Lutherans and her father was a pastor. 
And he one day, you know, he would be preaching and I was going to church and I was trying to figure out what this was and why their family felt so unified and happy and working together and ours was so dysfunctional. And he said, he said, you know, you have to invite Christ in. You have to ask Christ to be with you, to touch you. And so I thought, well, I'm going to try it. And I think I was 10 years old. And so I was in, on my bed and I invited that in, right? And um, I had the feeling that something opened up and there was this globe of golden white light that came toward me and expanded over me. And I felt this overwhelming presence and... So I had a, you know, at that point then I, I dove full into prayer and into Bible study, etc. And when I was then 14, I think, 14 years old, I became aware of the limits of fundamentalism. Yeah. And so I left that. And um, but I had that in my background. Mm -hmm. And later on, that also became a system of archetypes. Mm -hmm. So I had the archetypes from the Bible. I had the archetypes from astrology. Then I was, when I was in Europe, I met uh, my first boyfriend. Unfortunately, he wasn't there long and he already had plans to leave and our, our relationship disintegrated, but was a um, student of Jungian psychology. So I conducted months long uh, dream study and we went through the archetypes together according to how Jung would have analyzed my dreams. So then I got it from there. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was working with archetypes all along. It's like it never left me. It kept coming to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I loved about my teacher in the Alps was he said, forget all that just be with what's here now mm -hmm. don't like you can know that but what's here present now is the important thing right. and he said that when you when you come in contact with something that you're really meant to do in a sense something that really fits you to do that, that like everybody's looking for their purpose. It'll come to you as that, that, that moment of light. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had when I decided to write this book. Right. So I remember the moment I was like, I had already been researching it a couple of years, but all of a sudden it just, it just hit me this light. You're going to do this and it's going to make a difference. Yeah. And so that was my inspiration for that. Could so I, I don't could, know if that tracks exactly with what you were asking, but it's not exactly the re reluctant seer, mm -hmm. but it's more like looking for an avenue. How can I put my intellect, intuition, understanding mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. archetypes, you know, sort of holistic sensibility to work in a way that benefits others? Right. Well, I... <clears throat> it's it's absolutely a fit, and I'm I again would like to just reflect back and and uh, make sure that I'm hearing and and seeing in a good way with you. It seems like in this in the time we've been talking, it seems like you have touched into in your experience in the moment while you've been describing what you whatever chapter of life you were describing your accessing a certain core i would call it an organ of perception or the implicit senses the core of our experience and i i uh, folks who are in the support groups and so on that i offer will have seen me do this a thousand times it goes from about our our neck down to our perineum and it's that core element in our torso that uh, everything of 
of core value in our life emanates from there or it's received from there. So if you and I are standing on a cliff watching the sunset and without saying any words, we look at one another and we, we both are resonating in the extraordinary quality of the moment. In fact, those hairs on my arm are standing up right now as if I were on that that cliff and i think you've been going to that space as well as you've been sharing so you've been moved to tears just by visiting that place in what you're recounting uh, i just wanted to bring all of our attention to that because you're not just a person who kind of cries easily and okay let's get on with the story this is actually a way that human beings most deeply connect and uh, this guy, Ian McOchris, that I mentioned before, he also talks about those implicit senses. It's very much the realm of the right hemisphere, that right hemisphere that is the place where relationships come from there. And having context, ability to, to see the interrelatedness of, of it all comes from there. So I, I just want to acknowledge that you've punctuated what you've been sharing with us, these times in your life when, you know, so I would call that an, an act of power or an act of seeing. So you might not be a seer that, you know, predicts what's happening next year or some other psychic way of seeing, <clears throat> but this is uh, just as relevant uh, a part of what I would call seeing is to be able to see when elements in your personal experience within your body, within your field, line up in such a way that you are moved and you're clear that this is an, a, a signpost, if you will, of your purpose or the direction you're stepping into or that which matters most to you. So I'm just doing my best to reflect out what I'm think I'm hearing or seeing, kind of putting my way of saying it on, on it. And I don't mean to put words in your mouth. So I'm, I'm curious, does any of this uh, spark you to, to either, you know, kind of um, adjust the wording or, or shift what I'm saying to be more reflective of what you were actually sharing? Um, anything you'd like to say? Yeah, so the, the term core self, core self experience um, is something that I use a lot in my work as a hypnotherapist. And um, I, I work a lot with, um, specifically with people who um, have experienced recent trauma and grief. Not so much with people who have like addictions and um, way back trauma. One of the things that happens typically in the way that I work is that somebody will experience that core self and have that expansive feeling. And it's almost like they remember who they are, right? There's that sense of, wow, I haven't felt this in years, you know, the sense of self, this sense of wholeness, I never thought I would feel this again. And um, sometimes it's like confidence, um, a release of burdens. Um, and I always say when someone says that, because I don't want them to think that I did that to them. I didn't, right? I just know some processes that can help them get there. Um, but you kind of do do it because just like you're reflecting to me what you see in me just you know you're talking is helping me just to settle in and to go more into that state myself so we're kind of sharing it together and that's part of this conversation um and i always say this is you right this is who you are You've always, you know, and I remember our teacher telling us that he would say, you see yourself as these broken, 
you know, human beings with your flaws and everything, but I see you, you know, I see your wholeness. I see your spirit, your soul. And um, so that's something that often comes up in my work with others, just that moment of, wow. So, yeah. And it's also sometimes it's just deep. You don't even speak. It's just there. And when you become sensitive, so I wouldn't say that I'm not a seer. I would not say that I don't use that capacity or that I didn't develop it, but it's not what I offer to the world. And it's something that I only, I kind of let it happen to me if I have a sudden intuition or a sudden knowing or a dream. I don't sit down and try to remote view or see the future. So yeah, that's kind of how it lives in me. Yeah, I, I think we're in the neighborhood right now of what Elliot was doing his best to describe about how really I should be talking with you rather than him after mm -hmm. I was describing how I approach the Collapse Aware conversation and many of the difficulties that people have when they are first exposed to these existential global level predicaments. That's an extraordinary stressor on almost any human being that whose eyes are freshly open to it. Yeah. And I don't know about you, I'd, I'd love to hear what your experience of, of it is, but this, these core or implicit senses, this system, this, uh, these core uh, organs of perception, very different than the five senses we call normal. Um, I would assert that this is the single greatest inner resource we can touch into if indeed we're sincerely aware of our needing to face into a future the likes of which humanity's never seen there there are no other inner resources that come close in my experience what you and i are talking about that that universal but often hidden from people like we we can forget we can forget that we have access to it and yeah. it sounds like your part of your work is to help people remember who mm. they are remember what this core is yeah. that they actually they have access to it not your magic they have they can have it's access them, yes. to it. yeah right right so I'm I'm just curious if that sparks you to say anything. And really where I'm just previews of where I'd like to head out of this particular point is um I was struck by so many of the quotes that you sent me a, a set of slides uh describing a, a book that you've written, The Memories of Red Riding Hood, and just these slides with brief quotes from this book. And and this is the thing that I was trying to describe earlier there was so much similarity in, in not just the words themselves, because there's tremendous similarity in the words you use uh, to the ones that I use often in, in my body of work. Uh, but the there's this energetic, there's this um, context or tone that you weave through. I haven't read the book. I'm just talking about the slides. So I'm curious if there is anything you're sparked to share about my assertion that this is perhaps our greatest inner resource at a time when we desperately collect individually and collectively need the best resources we can find this is this is really a, a remarkable and and uh existential moment for humanity and um it's my experience that this is one of the most important inner resources we could call on and get access to. Does that spark you to share anything or reflect from your experience of it? I, I just think it's so difficult for most people to, to find it. And uh, it makes me very sad. Um, the book that I wrote, <laughs> I've got the original, I, I finished it in 2009 actually 
and had one copy printed up. And um, then I put it away because I thought it's very spiritual. And I thought it wasn't, I didn't want it to conflict with the importance of my other work, which is nonfiction. Didn't want people to say, oh, she's so full of woo, you know, you can't listen to her. But um, I took it out in 2021, uh, 20, last, no, last summer, and was reading it. Um, and I thought, this is the time for this book, because it's all about, in telling these stories, I'm as when you do hypnotherapy, this is so a lot of what you say about me, I have the sort of the two halves in balance. A lot of that has come th from my study of hypnotherapy because it's it's all about using metaphor and the way that the rational mind can be misled and programmed in and, and become active in destructive ways and the way that our emotional self can recalibrate the whole system. So I learned that in hypnotherapy, really. The hypnotherapist that I studied with, Rochelle Jaffa, is here in Ashland. And I don't think she's teaching anymore, but she's magnificent. And um, I went back to this book, which I wrote before I studied hypnotherapy. And I realized it was all there, just as I was saying that my teacher in Switzerland um, when I started hypnotherapy, I realized I had already learned this by sitting with this meditation teacher. This was just a form that now I could, it was like divided into tools that now I could consciously use to help somebody get, get more quickly into that, that core state of integration. Because when you get into that core state, what happens is a lot of integration can take place, a lot of healing of the nervous system. Um, but when you ask me, is it the most important? Um, I really don't know because my sense is that, you know, like a lot of people have a religious background. We don't know them here in the United States that much here. We're more secular. Um, but a lot of, you know, fundamentalist Christians during this state, will be able to get to their core self through prayer, right? So if they do really deep prayer and communion with the metaphors that they have around their system of God, they'll get there. And the same thing with the other religions. So my tendency is to say, get to the core of your religious belief, if that works for you, because that's something you have. You know, there's also a lot of shadow work, of course, with our religious beliefs, because a lot of them came to us with heavy do's and don'ts. But that's one way. And then this thing that that I'm offering that I I've been offering it to nurses and lactation consultants. I've been doing this grief class, which teaches these precepts and helps people heal do basic emotional healing while learning how to get into their core state to be more receptive to other people's uh, core injuries. Because when you're working with mothers, the field has been blown open, you know, their personal energetic field by the birth. So if you can enter that field with coherence and with a calm core state that already transfers to the mother and is very helpful. So that's, that's been the goal of my classes. And what happened though, is that while I was teaching these classes, the climate thing came to it and more people are, and, and the pandemic. So more people are in a deeper state of discombobulation from these experiences. So it's very difficult now when a group of people come together, there's so much going on that I don't know how you're finding it in your classes, but it's been a struggle for me to, I actually thought a while ago, what I want to do is the kind of work that you're offering to work with people who are on that, that edge of um, dealing with the deeper tragedies that are happening to us as a planet, as a planetary population, 
and I called the idea for the thing I wanted to offer awake for the awake for the planet, mm -hmm. a wake for the planet, mm -hmm. just being able yeah. to process that grief and get to our core state and to be able to meet it with that core integration. Yes. So I imagine that's something like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And what I'm imagining too, is that people who find that will be right for it. Like right. it's not for everybody, but those who find it will be ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I well said. And yes, I, I do think that's a, uh, it's a very fair description of a, a big part of my work. You know, we're, we're getting toward the end of this particular conversation and I just previews of coming attractions. I, I hope that you and I can uh, get back together on a very regular basis and explore deeper pockets of this conversation because that we're just barely, you know, covering the, getting the surface scratched here. I'm wondering if we could explore one particular uh, card, if you will. Um, I don't know what else to call this slide from your presentation about that Memories of Red Riding Hood book that you just held up a little while ago. And it's, this is again the, each of these slides. There were there were a number of them that just seemed like wow that could easily come out of my work right now. Uh, this is just an incredible fit. And one of them is a is a concept uh, well articulated by a person I consider to be one of my greatest mentors in the in terms of grief and in terms of matters of the soul. And. Um, one way he talks about uh, both of those topics at the same time is he talks about uh, that it, as being human beings, and especially coming from tens of thousands of years of being in uh, indigenous cultures that had far more of the mythopoetic core to them, one part of those cultures, many of those cultures, was to initiate a young person into adulthood. And that, take, that takes having the elders who are going to hold the space and design that, that experience and hold that experience for the young person and to welcome them back once they've come back from that experience in, back into the community. That would be a well-designed and well-held and, and a wholesome initiation to adulthood. And I'm I'm just looking at your expression right now, and I'm actually just cueing myself to slow down, to touch into that core that you and I have been talking about. And I'm actually quite moved in this moment because the term that you and I both have used in these, this way that I'm talking about overlapping is rough initiation. When there are no elders, there are no wise elders. There are no adults in the room on a global scale and the tragedy of that is for me hard to overstate i don't know how to find hyperbole here it's devastating to the human possibility yeah to the beauty that is possible in the human experience when an initiation is held in that wholesome mythopoetic core way. And <clears throat> it is also hard to overstate the, the cost of jamming ourselves into a rough initiation. We are handing the transformative possibility of initiation over to nature over to Mother Earth, who has no concern whatsoever for the continu continuity of human beings one way or the other. And uh, the price we will pay for our human impact on life um, show, will show up in this rough initiation and is showing up in this rough initiation. I'm 
pointing ahead to future conversations, which I'm hoping you're going to say, sure, let's do it. <laughs> and I'm wondering if we could close our time together in the last few minutes exploring this. I'm wondering if you have anything to share from, because we haven't actually talked about this piece at all. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to hear, how did you come up with those words? How did those words come into your vocabulary? And do you have any, any uh, reflection, any response to what I'm saying about my version of rough initiation? So uh, please. I'm going to disappoint you because I, okay. I took those words from you. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I was watching one of your interviews and I thought, oh my God, this is exactly the, the layout of this book, which is actually a process of initiation. So the book is, um, is Mayana and her grandmother. And Mayana, the grandmother's sh shamanic wise one. And Mayana is uh, an initiate on the path. And they do f a future visioning together. And as they do the future visioning, they actually look to the future through the stories of the girls' tales and the Grimm's fairy tales that we know. And um, it goes from the shadow work, which is encapsulated in the, the story of Red Riding Hood, and um, through to the initiation or the preparation for initiation with isolation that Rapunzel experiences in the tower. And then learning how to perceive reality more clearly to hone your perception with the symbol of the mirror in Snow White. And then in, um, in our story of uh, Cinderella, it's the story of the rough initiation. And the stories are retold in a completely different way, but using the same elements. And what happens when you have that, when you feel that deep calling, and you a lot of people feel that, that calling from, you said the starry sky from nature, from the trees, just from yourself, just that deep calling for wholeness and for reunification. Mm -hmm. And there's also ensoulment is a word that I recently used, right. learned. I love that mm -hmm. because I think that the way that our society is working on us today is to dry up, to desiccate our soul, right. our soul life and our experience to soul. And soul has even become a word that is, um, you know, it's kind of taboo. You shouldn't use that if you want to be a respectable person. Right. Um, but if you feel that calling for reunification, what happens? Well, what happened to my mother and my mother's, I guess my mother's tale is in here is that she went through a period of psychosis. Okay. And so I let Cinderella's vision of the dance and of her unification with uh, the prince be her psychosis that unifies her with her inner self mm -hmm. and and where she stays for a long time unreachable by the outside world but she comes back enlightened which is a reflection on the story of um Sri Ananda my ma who went through something very similar with her family in India so I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Uh, to me, it is in that what we're, what we're looking at here, uh, from my perspective, is two, two fellow walkers of, on the path. And uh, of course, our paths are different. And um, I'm just struck by also how many similarities there are how many overlapping elements there are and it seems like this is uh, an important time for those of us on the path in this way to wanting to be of service to others so that they might expand their capacity to be present in the face of larger and larger stressors uh, 
expand their capacity to be of service to the people they love in very troubled times. It seems like we're both up to that. That seems like we do it differently, but that's more or less how I would sum up what we both seem to be doing. And I, I think we've just now gotten to know each other. We've gotten to introduce ourselves a little bit. We've gotten to put our toe in the water of some of, the, some of those places of overlap. Again, I'm looking ahead to our next conversation where, uh, and I'm looking forward also to the, actually the comments that might show up in the comments section underneath this video when we post it. I'd also be very interested to hear what viewers of this uh, particular conversation, what they're sparked to share of their experience of the elements that you and I have taken the time to describe a bit, um, not the least of which is this idea of rough initiation. You know, how does it ring for you? Is, is this something that makes sense from their experience? And uh, is there some way that they uh, are, are finding their way through this excruciating process of having a rough initiation rather than one that is appropriately held. Um, also, I, I just know that there are many people who are relu uh, reluctant seers or just unaware of their gifts, but there's, there's something that keep nud keeps nudging, S certainly the way it showed up for me is uh, in my very, very troubled youth, there, there were these truths that kept showing up, especially when I would go out and spend a tremendous amount of time in nature, which I did, and with the ocean, as I did. These messages kept coming through. And thank goodness, I then wove those messages into a set of practices that have lasted now for more years than I'd like to admit. So I'm looking forward to you and me getting back together, if you're willing, and um, I'd like to to dive a bit more deeply into some of the distinctions that you've written up, uh, as I mentioned about your your uh, slides describing uh, the memories of Red Riding Hood, one of those two books that you've shown up uh, shown us on the screen, and. Um, I'd like to ask a favor of you, it, just to wrap up this particular uh, conversation. We're also talking to folks who are coll collapse aware. Some of them are brand new to this shocking conversation. Some of them, some folks have been around for decades. I'm curious if there's anything that you might share to someone who is new, perhaps the, the newer folks to the conversation uh, about how to, how to find your center in troubling times. It sounds like a number of times in your life, you have chosen a path to bring yourself volitionally back to center when life is kind of taking you off center. And I'm curious if you'd have anything to suggest, because it, it seems like that's a portion of what the work is you do, inviting people to, to reclaim their center. That's, again, it may not be exactly the words you use. It's close. The problem is that I think a lot of people aren't able to access that because their nervous system is toxic. So I'd like to encourage people to know that that is something that you, you should be able to do. And if you can't attend to your nervous system, vitamin Bs, right? Vitamin Bs, magnesium. A lot of people are deficient in essential nutrients that we need to calm the nervous system to get there. Um, I actually started using resveratrol and ashwagandha a few months ago um, because of the, the panic that's coming with the climate and with the pandemic. And those two things are supposed to be helpful for long COVID. 
Mm -hmm. which I briefly had, and I started using these heavy antioxidants, particular ones, and I thought, wow, it just, it really helps me get yes. there. So one of the things I think is really important to say to people is this isn't something you should just be able to do mm -hmm. quickly. You may, there may be some steps to it. Mm -hmm. And one of them may be calming your nervous system with hydration, vitamin Bs, magnesium, other um, minerals and vitamins and some, some um, important uh, antioxidants. Mm -hmm. And then it can get a lot easier. And then you talk about breath work, mm -hmm. you know, as I do, I think we use a lot of similar techniques to initiate that transition into calm. Right. And um, I would just say, do a deep dive and find out where are your resources? What are the experiences of your life that have felt good and remember them? Right. Because right. just the memory can take you there and help yeah. you get there. And I think this is a longer conversation and I'm really looking sure forward is. to having it. Yeah. Yeah, I would call this, this next chapter of our conversation, the first aid level resilience skills in my progression that it, folks who've been around either the podcast or, or the body of work that I got and in the livingresilience.net website and on the programs page, which is called Deep Academy. This is one of the um, central topic areas for the introductory courses that I offer, which is when you're new to the topic, or even if you've been around for a while, we might, we, most of us are not trained in how to self-regulate, how to bring ourselves back to center when life has had its way with us, had us right. smacked us upside the head, so to speak. Yeah. And so how we can bring ourselves back with, in any number of different ways sounds like it could be a, a rich next chapter of our conversation to go there. Um, Hillary Jacobson, it's been just a joy. Um, it does feel like there's this way in which we have been co-regulating this entire conversation. It just feels like we've just kind of gotten into this uh, resonance, resonant frequency, and I, it feels wonderful. I'm so glad to have met you. I'm so glad your brother suggested this so strongly. I look forward to when we do chapter two of this conversation. Me too. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to say to just wind this up? My brother's going to be happy. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to Me too. when we I, thank get you together so much. Again. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Music today from Michael Hedges, as always, and also Port Blue into the Sea. Also available on our website, www.livingresilience.net, is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.